Okay, well, welcome to all the attendees. My name is Mark Graham. I'm a faculty member in the Theology and Religious Studies Department at Villanova University, and I'm also the chair of the Villanova University Task Force on the Sexual Abuse Crisis in the Catholic Church. This is going to be our last webinar for this uh, semester. I'm glad everybody is here with us. Uh, today we have Dr. Brian Cletus, who is an expert on clergy sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. Brian works at Case Western Reserve University, where he directs several humanities initiatives and teaches in the departments of religious study, history, anthropology, and women's studies. Prior to Case Western, Brian had completed his MA in theories of religion at the University of Chicago and his PhD in American religious history at Northwestern University. Brian's current book project, titled Surviving Soul Murder, examines the faith and spirituality of American survivors. Through their courage and activism, Catholic survivors have not only changed the Catholic Church, but also dramatically reshaped American laws on child abuse. Alongside feminist movements like Take Back the Night and Hashtag Me Too, clergy abuse survivors have also helped to expand our public understandings of abuse and to lessen the social stigma of sexual assault. Brian also speaks and publishes on the history of other progressive lay Catholic movements, including the group's call to action and voice of the faithful, as well as earlier generations involved in the Catholic worker and the liturgical movement. He is especially interested in the ways that Catholic women have contributed distinctively to American history and culture. Throughout the 20th century, lay women like Dorothy Day, Patty Crowley, and Barbara Blaine put their faith to work in addressing some of this century's most pressing concerns, including immigration, poverty, racism, birth control, and nuclear proliferation. Tonight, Brian is going to talk about the importance of listening to survivors and the work that all of us can do to help support survivors in our own communities. Brian, it's so good to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me, Mark, and thank you to everyone at Villanova, and especially to all of you on the call. I see some familiar names uh, in the participants, so it's excellent to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint um, to kind of walk us through and keep it more visually interesting. Um, I'm going to rush through some of the slides, so I apologize in advance. Um, as will become clear, I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground, um, but we'll dig deeper when we get into um, some of my most recent research here. So this is a brief overview. Um, you'll see variations of this image throughout the, uh, the presentation tonight. This comes from one of the first survivor groups in the world. Their acronym was VOCAL, Victims of Clergy Abuse Linkup, and they were later known simply as um, Linkup. They were frustrated, um, on the one hand, by the church's inability to hear listen or talk about their abuse. And as I'll discuss more, they really um, came to understand voice and speaking as sacred. So I wanna give you a brief history of the clergy sexual abuse scandal in the United States. I wanna unpack my most recent research on this, which I call a theology of voice. Then I wanna give us some ideas kind of in a very um, pragmatic way, what survivors have told me they want when they first talk to um, people from the diocese, community members, neighbors, even family, and then reflect on what that requires of us in order to really receive them with an open heart and an open mind. All right, so here's that history. As we all remember just before the pandemic, 2018 and 2019 were really nightmarish. Um, if you were a Catholic, um, even if you've been following uh, for the last 20 years plus on this topic, it seemed and felt like a cascade of one news event right after another. Um, and I know it was emotionally painful for me. It was both painful, but also kind of vindicating for many survivors. Um, but it elicited a lot of reactions, um, a, a big desire by many universities to do more on this. 
So over the past month, I've spoken to the University of Scranton. Uh, I was at conferences at Gonzaga University, the University of Notre Dame. Um, Fordham sponsored another one of them. And then the University of California, Riverside and other non-Catholic institutions have also been doing these kind of conferences. And most of that was put into place or set in motion by the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report. But as you can see on the slide, there was one thing after another that year and was very, very painful. So for a lot, I've learned that for some survivors and most Americans and a, a large percentage of American Catholics, the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report has become the touchstone for our engagement with survivors and with clergy sexual abuse. But this first section is going to kind of remind us of the 60 year history that preceded it. So in the 1950s, there was um, a priest, Father Gerald Fitzgerald, who founded the Servants of the Paraclete. He created a treatment facility originally for priests suffering from addiction like alcoholism. But he was sent um, many uh, priests who had been uh, known by their bishop to be abusing children and became pretty upset about that, um, not just about the, the kind of flow of these priests, but also by the fact that they were being sent to him under these um, disguised uh, treatment for, for things like alcoholism or dependency. So he actually alerted the Vatican. Um, he wrote to Pope Paul VI and met with him in person. And this cuts against our understanding of Paul VI and his kind of broader um, writing and very, you know, of course, the very influential papal encyclical Humanae Vitae, where he talks beautifully. I mean, that, that encyclical gets a lot of heat from certain Catholics, but speaks beautifully about marriage, about the importance of sexuality. Um, then in the 1970s, uh, there was a commission. Sorry, my slideshow is not keeping up with my pointer. Um, the bishops commissioned the multiple studies on priestly sexuality. One of these was by Father Eugene Kennedy, a sociologist in Chicago. And he found out that, among other things, 60% of priests at the time admitted openly to him that they were involved in sexual relationships and consensual sexual relationships, and we can presume mostly with adults. Um, but this was the beginning of kind of an unpacking from the bishop's perspective of what celibacy meant in the lived and daily lives of many priests. In the 1980s, victims really began to come forward en masse. So if you've seen um, the HBO documentary, a wonderful film, uh, Mea Culpa, uh, that came up maybe 10 years ago now. It was on survivors who came forward in, in Greater Milwaukee in the 1970s, and they were um, at a school for the deaf. And so their struggle to, to kind of create that voice was, was multifold. Um, and so there were these pockets of victims coming forward prior to the 1980s, but the 1980s really began. Um, to have a critical mass for the survivor movement. So here's uh, Jason Berry, who um, wrote in the Times Pecan and later in the New York Times and other national publications about Father Gilbert Gauthier from uh, New Orleans. And Gauthier was one of these kind of infamous abusers who had many, many victims. So it, it galvanized the country. It was the first national story about clergy sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. And it spurred and empowered a lot of other victims to come forward. It also um, spurred Tom Doyle, who at the time was working at the Vatican. Um, he was uh, the equivalent of the Vatico Vatican Embassy to the United States, right? The Papal Nuncio's office in Washington, D.C. He was a canon lawyer. And it was actually the defense attorney that the church hired, the bishops hired in New Orleans to defend them against the Gauthier allegations, um, an attorney named Roy Mouton, and an openly gay priest who ran a treatment center um, in Maryland, the St. Luke's Institute. And the three of them co-authored this report, uh, The Problem of Sexual Molestation by Clergy in 1985. And they hand, uh, delivered and mailed copies to every bishop in the United States. They also presented on this at the meeting of um, what we now call the USCCB, then the National um, Catholic Bishops Association, the N NCBB. I'm, I'm getting one of those letters wrong. <laughs> and uh, shortly after that, survivors started to form their own organizations. I'll talk a little bit about this in a few minutes. But here um, you've got on the far left, uh, Father Tom Doyle in the prior photo. On the far right, Jason Berry, that same journalist. 
In between them, many of you will recognize Father Andrew Greeley. Um, the priest in the middle, or former priest, former Benedictine, is Richard Seip, who was a psychologist and another very early whistleblower on this. Jean Miller, uh, the woman in the center, founded Vocal, along with Marilyn Steffel, who was the director of religious education at St. Edna's Parish in Chicago, where her son had been molested. And the only uh, person kind of distant from the, the, the uh, Catholic Church here um, is the attorney Jeff Anderson, who's got the, the more traditional necktie on in the photo. So throughout the 1990s, survivors really began to forge a national movement. Um, at one point, you re might remember uh, Stephen Cook alleged that Cardinal Joseph Bernadine had been one of his abusers at a seminary in Ohio. Cook later recanted those allegations, and Bernadine's um, legacy on this is really mixed because early survivors in Chicago, involved with multiple groups, really felt um, that the Colonel Bernadine was one of the few bishops who listened to them and who provided them with outstanding support. On the other hand, he was himself accused, and we still really don't know the veracity of those allegations. But one of the effects of um, Cook recanting and him and Bernadine reconciled, and then they they died shortly thereafter, Bernadine of cancer and Cook of AIDS. Um, one of the immediate effects was that there was a, a national chill, if you will, on journalism and scholarly um, kind of accounting for the clergy abuse crisis. So there had been this growing sense that this really deserved our attention um, as Catholics and also as scholars. And after uh, the Bernadine allegations became unclear, I think a lot of journalists uh, and academics kind of felt like they had, had been hung out to dry, they, they weren't sure whether this um, was the issue they had presumed, and so they kind of chilled out for a few years. That all changed, of course, in 2002, when the Boston Globe released their Spotlight Report. I'm sorry about the slideshow being so slow. Um, and, you know, cardinal law really came under fire. So um, survivors generally like the, the film spotlight. Um, there, are, there are a number of problems with that I'm sure many of you know, but from a survivor's standpoint, it's it does an okay job of kind of looking in particular at how Phil Saviano, the survivor identified in it, um, who kept pestering the globe to take up this case how he really um, convinced them and, and worked tirelessly um, to get this into the news. In 2011, um, Philadelphia's Monsignor Lynn had been convicted. That has since been um, overturned, but is awaiting, uh, I believe it's second or third retrial in 2015. The film Spotlight won the Academy Award for Best Picture, so this is really mainstream news well before Pennsylvania. As we said, Pennsylvania in 2018 and then in 2019, um, the Vatican held a very momentous summit. Not many pragmatic solutions came from it, but survivors at least held out hope um, pre-COVID that this was going to be a watershed moment that would signal some real reform within the church. So that was your, um, you know, history of clergy sexual abuse in the United States and survivor advocacy movements in uh, three minutes. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about what I call a theology of voice. And this is my term um, from a recent article I published in U.S. Catholic Historian called A Theology of Voice Focal in the Catholic Clergy Abuse Survivor Movement. This cover is from um, a 2020 issue. I couldn't find the most recent cover for the journal. Um, but just an hour ago, actually, I got a telephone call from Fordham University's current center, sorry, Curran Center for American Catholic Studies to tell me that this article won um, a, a major prize, the, the best new scholar essay prize um, from the Curran Center. So very honored and humbled by that. Um, but if you would like to read the full article, I'm sure I can find a way for the journal's editor, Father David Andreas, to, to get a copy to Mark that he, he might be able to share. So in 1992, um, Gene Miller's nonprofit, Vocal, later known simply as The Link Up, um, staged what they called um, the first annual national healing conference. 500 survivors um, from mostly from the United States, but also from Canada, Britain, Australia, and Mexico came to that first conference. 
And, you know, if, if it wasn't obvious from their acronym vocal, voice was very important to them um, from the start of the survivor movement. So this quote from, from Jean is very powerful. We turn to them as children, she said, and then as adults, we turn to them in vulnerability. This weekend has allowed us to release that child's voice within us, that voice that has been screaming and to turn it into a prophetic voice that can move the church forward. And there's so much in that statement. Um, you hear, first of all, um, the pain of coming forward to the church um, as child victims of coming forward to other adults like their parents. Then the pain of what they later call revictimization, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, revictimization is survivors' terms for when they speak to um, the church, church attorneys, their priest, fellow parishioners, and are greeted with skepticism um, or interrogation instead of with sympathy. Um, and I'll talk about the importance of beginning kind of from a, a, a presumption of truth on behalf of survivors when you first hear from one. Um, they feel that as a pent up voice as something that kind of has been delayed about their own development, um, both as individuals, many struggle with uh, dependency, with homelessness, um, some take their own life from suicide, uh, but also delay in terms of their relationships. Many are unmarried or remain very uncertain about their sexual orientation and preferences. And my research really focuses on their relationship with God and how they have attempted to recreate and reforge that. But one of the things, perhaps the thing that makes clergy, clergy sexual abuse inherently different from secular forms of sexual abuse, whether that be incest or partner abuse or sexual assault, is that you know we as Catholics believe that priests are acting as Christ in persona Christi in the moment of uh, communion um, or alter Christi theologically, and that priests, you know, as we all were taught, have this very special and unique connection to the divine. So when a child is abused by a priest, many of them, not all, but many feel that as a form of abuse by God, it causes them kind of to experience chaos in terms of their inner faith. Um, and it's a very specific form of abuse, um, a kind of spiritual abuse on top of the physical sexual abuse. So something to really keep in mind when we're, when we're working with survivors in the Catholic context. I'm not really going to go into it um, tonight because I want to reserve our time for conversation and some of these other questions, but the article that this comes from traces the lineage of Catholic survivors from secular survivor movements, particularly the women's movement, um, the movement of rape victims, um, in, in things that we now would, would recognize, for example, in Take Back the Night or in the Me Too movement, um, from AIDS victims, and also and especially from incest victims. And so this is a quotation from a sociologist of the incest movement, Carol Berninger, uh, Dr. Carol uh, Burnage is her name, and she said, the key is connection of the survivor with her history, of the present with the past, of the lost, numbed out feelings with the words that release them. So this kind of divine uh, agency, this theology, the sacrality with which survivors come to abuse, acts of speech, acts of hearing, of listening, of voice, um, does take on a specifically and distinctively Catholic tone. But it is important to recognize that voice, and especially women reclaiming their agency by narrating their own voice, writing their own stories, um, being able to tell their own histories, that that shares an inheritance with the feminist movement more broadly. And one of the, the kind of contributions of my research in this area is that that comes smack up against our popular notions of clergy sexual abuse as being a problem of male priests who are abusing mostly boy children. Um, statistically, we don't have great data. The John Jay reports um, from 2004 and 2006 do suggest that there were uh, slightly more male victims than female victims, but there were certainly many um, priests who sexually assaulted girls, as well as uh, a, a fairly high number of women religious or nuns who assessed um, assaulted young boys or young girls. So it's not this kind of um, 
male on male dynamic that we've made it out to be. And, and that has obscured the importance of the feminist movement for really um, informing how Catholic survivors have framed the debate, have articulated themselves, have come to find their voice within American society. Um, so I'm trying to uplift that here. Early on, Vocal, um, as I said, really was the first organized group in the world of Catholic survivors, which is why I chose them as my case study. But they were also an umbrella organization for survivors um, that would go on to form their own survivor advocacy groups. In the center of this photo, this is an award ceremony at one of the early uh, vocal conferences where they're kind of recognizing some of their star volunteers for the year. Um, on the right, uh, the younger gentleman is Father Tom Economist. You'll see an image of him later. He often wore a collar. He was ordained in the independent uh, Catholic Church. He had been abused first as a, a young child at a Catholic boarding school and later as a seminarian in a Roman Catholic seminary, but later um, did proceed becoming ordained in the independent church. Um, in, and, and he served um, for nearly a decade as LinkUp's president and, and forward-facing person. The, the two women, Marilyn Steffel, the director of religious education, and um, Jean Miller, dropped out of LinkUp kind of after they had gotten it started. It took them about a decade to go from um, when Miller's son was abused to that first conference in 1992. And then after a year and a half of, of the kind of me uber media spotlight, um, they handed over the reins to Tom. So he's the younger man here. The woman in the center is Barbara Blaine. Uh, you might recognize her name. She was the founder of the Survivors Network of Those Abused by Priests, or SNAP, which since Boston, at least, since about 2002, which by pure chance, Tom, the, the charismatic leader of Link Up for 10 years, died of pancreatic cancer suddenly in the spring of 2002, just as the Boston Globe um, reporting, spotlight teams reporting on abuse uh, under cardinal law really gathered international attention. So journalists and survivors and concerned Catholics across the country were calling Link Up's hotline, but the office you know, was run on a shoestring budget and the office basically couldn't respond in the immediate aftermath of his death. They didn't have the organization, the funding, or, or the staffing in, in place. So um, who did they reach out to? They reached out to SNAP in part because Phil Saviano, that survivor who comes forward in the film Spotlight and who was really instrumental, he had been um, appointed by Barbara, the woman in the center here, the leader of SNAP, to be the SNAP delegate for all of New England. Um, so SNAP was kind of fortuitously uh, positioned at the time to take over. But something to remember about Barbara that's been lost in our, our kind of, she, she had a more um, kind of attack approach to the church, a more antagonistic approach than Vocal did. But something that was, was rarely mentioned about her in media coverage is that Barbara was a Catholic worker, a peace activist, um, and, and a devout Catholic um, all of her life. Um, and she considered herself a devout Catholic until her death um, in 2017. She had just retired from SNAP and was hiking on her first vacation with uh, her husband Howard in Utah when she, um, she, she died of an unknown heart condition on the hike. So that's Barbara in the center. And then on the left side of your screen here, the older gen gentleman is uh, Frank Fitzpatrick, who had his own survivor nonprofit, Survivors Connection, which was um, a very important uh, group on the East Coast as well. Probably more than you wanted to know about these three individuals. So what does this uh, theology of voice mean? And here I'm going to kind of outline it and also read to you a little bit from that recent paper. So first survivors, I think I skipped a slide here. Vocal preach that voice held this, the ontological power. Ontology means it changes your being. So for example, um, we as Catholics believe there's an ontological shift when the priest consecrates the communion wafer and it is turned into the body and blood of Christ. So it's, it's a, a special word in, in phenomenology or a certain branch of philosophy uh, that signals something that other people, um, really secularist, atheists might call magical, is going on here. So victims groups, uh, the early victims groups in the United States, preached that voice held the power to change them from victims into survivor. In other words, the act of speech was utterly central to um, moving from passive or victimized into active and moving on. Um, they don't like the phrase moving on, but kind of 
not letting that childhood abuse define all of them in adulthood. More specifically, they held that individual speech was healing, that communal testimonies had this prophetic potential. You heard that in Jean Miller's a quote from the 92 conference, that their voices could help move the church forward. That ecclesiastical truth-telling was salvific, not just for them, but for priests and for bystanders. Um, and again, it's my term theology here, but I'm, I'm trying to get at how voice itself encompassed many different forms of speaking, listening, and even silencing that defined the good and evil um, ways that, that we could respond to survivors in their own view. I'm gonna wait for my slide to change or else I'll have to rewind. <laughs> okay, I'll just leave it on this one. So the first is that speaking aloud was the first step in what survivors called the journey towards wholeness. And that was a phrase that came up again and again at their annual healing conferences. I should say that those healing conferences were often held at seminaries, um, at Catholic universities in the early years, and that in the early and all the way through the 1990s, really until 1998, Catholic bishops across the country partnered with uh, Link Up and Vocal to sponsor survivors. So the first survivor conference, uh, they collected those donations from bishops. They sponsored over 200 survivors to come and join that, that first group of 500. Um, so there was this more collaborative um, relationship between American bishops, uh, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, there's the right acronym, NCCB, later the USCCB, and um, these formal survivor advocacy groups. Part of what happened, I've learned through my research, is that as the survivor movement gathered steam, more and more survivors came forward. And even though Vocal um, actually discouraged survivors from hiring an attorney or litigating against the church, um, a high enough percentage of survivors did ultimately go that route that it put tremendous, as we now know, tremendous financial uh, strain and legal pressure on many dioceses. And, um, that caused the bishops to retract their support for these groups gradually, such that in the early 1990s, there was all this potential and possibility for really working together, survivors and bishops and priests. And by, you know, by Boston in 2002, they were, they were very much separate camps um, that were not speaking to one another except through attorneys. Um, the church did introduce those attorneys first, um, but that's a whole other story. So the speaking aloud is really important towards this journey towards wholeness voicing aloud the brutal reality of one's abuse they preached was the first and most basic act through which survivors could rid themselves of shame admit that it was not their fault and begin to recognize uh, the trauma of what they called soul murder so this is a term that comes up a lot in my research survivors have re referred to their childhood abuse as soul murder um, i think that my best guess is that they actually um, adopted that phrase and made it their own from clinical psychology. So um, Freud and you know, Sigmund Freud in the early 20th century in his study of a psychiatric uh, Daniel Paul Schrieber and before him Henrik Ibsen in some prominent plays in the late 19th century had coined this term soul murder. In the 1960s through 1970s, an American clinical psychologist at Harvard, Leonard Shangold, resurrected it in the American clinical context for the treatment of child sexual abuse, especially child incest. And in part because of our, our belief as Catholics that priests are fathers, we call them father. Um, there's this patriarchal secession I talked about before between the priest and, um, and God. Um, I think many clinical psychologists thought this was an apt term, but survivors, Catholic survivors heard it differently and they began to imbue the term soul murder with a distinctively Catholic theology and they tied it to a more narrow understanding of their own spirituality and Catholic faith. Whereas the way these clinical psychologists and Freud used it, they were talking about the soul more as kind of what animated um, the life of a person, what gave them the will to live, what defined their identity and how they understood themselves in relationship to others. So for Schengel, soul murder is the shattering of a child's most significant relationships. Um, and incest was his paradigmatic case because if a child can't trust their own parents, who can they talk to? What is the safe space? Where is the home for a child abused by their parents? Um, a child abused by the priest sometimes goes another another level 
again, as I mentioned earlier, how do they trust God? Where is the terra firma, if you will, for their faith, um, being what they're taught in school and Catholic schools, the nuns who are educating them every day. And for some survivors, I can't put a percentage on it, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's more than 50% of survivors who were abused in the 40s through 60s, when they told their parents, their parents um, basically re-silenced them or participated in that re-victimization, either by telling them, you know, don't dare say that about father, you know, how could you say that? Don't, don't repeat that, um, or not believing them. And some parents participated willingly in their in their children's abuse by kind of understanding the priest had a, a special and unhealthy fondness for them, but wanting the family uh, to remain in that priest's grace and to be kind of enjoying their prominence within the parish. The second um, act of a of, of voice here is remembering. So through speaking to one another, through talking about their abuse, survivors were able to come to terms with what they would lost as children, whether that be a relationship with a sibling or with their classmates or with God himself. They viewed listening to one another as an act of communion. And I'll give you a quote here um, from Dee Miller, who was um, a Protestant married to a Catholic and deeply involved in vocal. She said, when we listened to one another, it was even more healing than telling our own stories. That intimate sharing created an instant sense of community. So communion here in the sense that it was sacral, but also in the sense that it forged their bonds with one another. Public speech was something that they viewed as a necessary um, sacrifice. And I want to I want to dwell on this one for, for a moment. So when survivors spoke to journalists or held public protests, they understood themselves as bearing witness, offering up their most intimate experiences of pain and hope to ensure that the church protected children in the future. So Father Tom Economist, the, the younger man in that photo before, who you'll see later in a, in a caller, um, he talked about the media's role as perhaps their only safeguard for accountability. This is a quote from, from Father Economist. All survivors are concerned that perpetrators never have an opportunity to hurt another child again. And many of us come to recognize that going public may be the most effective, if not the only way to accomplish that. So it wasn't so much that they really wanted to um, slander the priest. In fact, they, they worried, early survivors worried about whether this might drive um, other Catholics out of the pews, whether it might bankrupt their parish or diocese. Um, so they were really torn on this, this issue of whether or not to speak publicly, but ultimately they decided that, um, that, that Catholics and Americans would both benefit from learning about their experiences. And towards that end, they thought about truth telling as a gift. Um, they worked, as I had mentioned earlier, really closely with the National Conference of Catholic Bishops in the, in the 1990s. Um, the bishops actually invited panels of survivors to come to their um, annual gatherings and present and tell their stories. And throughout the year, um, the leaders of Vocal and later of SNAP and these other Catholic groups, survivor groups, would travel the country speaking to individual parishes. Um, I'll mention here parenthetically, of course, that Voice of the Faithful, the main lay um, group, involves some survivors, but mostly concerned lay persons that formed in Boston in 2002 uh, at St. John the Baptist in Wellesley, Massachusetts. They started, of course, with listening sessions in their basement. So survivors had kind of been paving the way for this model of speaking and listening um, but for 20 years prior to Boston. I hadn't really talked about it yet, but they also viewed uh, silence or deafness as sinful. So the inverse, right, of talking is not talking, of hearing is, is not hearing. We go back to that image of the priest covering their mouths and their um, ears. And of course, that comes from uh, a famous um, traditional Southeast Asian trope um, of usually depicted through monkeys, um, not seeing, not hearing, not speaking. 
So just briefly on silences, um, the, their theology of voice was undergirded by a foundational understanding of silence as sin. From their childhood abuse, survivors had learned firsthand how silence, silences and secrets enabled and deepened their initial trauma. As adults, they came to understand briefly deafness as a form of revictimization, that term I mentioned before. And they came to see church secrets as pastoral harm. So um, if you've been following since the Pennsylvania grand jury, you know that many district attorneys across the country are subpoenaing church documents. Um, church archives have shut down or been consolidated. Dioceses have made it difficult for researchers as well as just um, Catholics interested in learning about their family history, maybe, or their parish history, much more difficult for all of us to get into the archives. So uh, survivors recognize this as a form of sin, or at least that's that's how they view this effort to clamp down on church archives and the use of secret archives, which are actually necessitated under canon law and kept by every diocese in the world. So these critiques of silence elucidate why victims place such hope in the redemptive power of voice. Their shared experiences of revictimization reawaken the tangible anguishes of being silenced and intimidated as children, while also bonding them together, not only through that childhood trauma of abuse, but also and more recently through this wounds of revictimization. Diocesan attempts to deny survivors experience of abuse cause new spiritual and institutional harm. And what I want to reiterate there is that um, you might presume that these survivor organizations in your parish or in your state or these big national ones that the main um, touch point, so to speak, for the survivors who decide to join those is their similar experiences of childhood sexual abuse. I found that's not actually the case. There are many different contexts in which abuse occurred, many different um, personalities of the priests and nuns and lay teachers who perpetrated the abuses and many different experiences of survivors. So I like to say that no two survivors were abused in exactly the same way. There are exceptions for survivors who were abused together, but um, it's important to remember that like we often use this word assault or abuse, um, or I'm trying not to use the word rape in this because I know it's so triggering for so many of us. Um, but th their experiences were vastly different as children. What was actually very uniform is this revictimization, the church's initial silencing of them as kids, and then especially its denial or its invocation, um, especially after Boston, of legal frameworks for adjudicating abuse. So these survivor groups um, are predicated in many ways on the bond of revictimization, their, their shared experiences of feeling like they are not being heard and not allowed to speak the truth in their own parishes and dioceses. Okay, so on to the third section here, and I'll try to go a little more quickly because I'm keeping track of time. Um, so how do we listen to survivors? What do they want from us and from the church? Let my computer catch up to my mouse here. First, they want acknowledgement of what happened. Um, this is a friend and, and survivor, Trish Cahill, um, shown in the Jersey here um, with one of her abusers over her lifetime was abused by three priests and one nun. Trish maintained a relationship with um, this woman for 30 years, um, started as a 13 year old and she wasn't able to extricate herself from that relationship until she was in her mid forties, which again, blurs the lines um, from a legal standpoint of what is abuse and what is consent. But Trish, um, her story has been picked up by a number of outlets. She was on the Oprah Network uh, and Dr. Oz the last few years. Um, but if you'd like, I'm, I'm happy to forage you a series of Huffington Post articles about her, um, as well as a documentary short they made. Um, but Trish had struggled. She'd gone through three um, non-disclosure agreements or settlements um, before and after Pennsylvania. She, she's victim who was victimized mostly in New Jersey, but also in Pennsylvania, and New York. After the Pennsylvania grand jury report, she said, you know, what I want most now is not the money, but I want to just be able to speak publicly about what happened to me. And so she kind of found the courage in working with these major media outlets to, um, to violate, frankly, the, the terms of her non-disclosure agreement, which are the same types of, these are called hush settlements often, the same type of legal agreements um, that have been so, 
publicly criticized uh, in the wake of Me Too. They want recognition of their suffering. So this is Barbara Blaine on the right, um, along with um, another uh, volunteer at, at SNAP. Um, the woman in the foreground is Therese, and um, she was, again, abused by not just priests, but by nuns. Had a very difficult experience as one of Barbara's lieutenants in SNAP because Barbara never wanted her to speak about the abuse by nuns. She only kind of wanted her to stay on message with the public perception that this was a problem of pedophile priests. Um, but I like to talk about uh, Therese because she is such a tough and inspiring, strong woman. She was a New York City police detective for over 25 years. She's now retired and back in Chicago, but this has left permanent scars on her faith, on her capacity to have relationships outside of the kind of most immediate. Um, and, and yet she is, is by many standards, one of the more functional and highly functioning survivors you would meet. Uh, this is Rick Springer, um, a, another early kind of co-founder of Vocal um, and a fixture of the Chicago and national survivor movements. Rick died in 2013. Um, he would talk a lot about how he had survived homelessness. He had survived the Vietnam War. He had survived cancer, but the thing he hadn't survived was his soul murder. And he really, really sought for a place that he could take communion without becoming physically sick. So like many survivors, um, he gravitated towards intentional Eucharistic communities and women priests. Some survivors, of course, did um, leave the faith entirely, maybe turning to agnostic or atheism. Many turned towards another faith, sometimes Buddhism or Judaism. Uh, an even higher percentage to Protestantism. But what I found in my research, and this really surprised me, is that most survivors stay in the Catholic tradition they were raised in, and they seek a way to be Catholic that doesn't constantly re-trigger them or cause those feelings of victimization. So you might not see them in your parish, but they might be down the street at an IEC um, with some of the parishioners um, you, you do see every week. Apologies for the computer issues here. Something survivors really want is penance from the bishops, not apologies, but confessions and acts of atonement. I can talk about that more maybe in the Q&A, but for example, um, this is a, a photograph from the, the 2019 Synod in, in the Vatican. This is what everyone got to see of it. It was a closed door session. It did involve some women religious. It did involve a very small group of invited survivors at a separate session. Um, but how different would it have been, for example, if the cardinals had gotten on their knees and processed around um, the circle in St. Peter's Square and asked for uh, forgiveness rather than um, issuing these blanket and rather bland apologies. And this is, of course, um, the same thing that pilgrims do to Fatima, um, one of the major pilgrim sites in Portugal. They want support from local parishioners, a voice within the church. Um, this is Jim Vansickle, uh, who came out as part of the ban uh, Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report. Um, his abuse uh, involved the University of Notre Dame and also a number of camps within Pennsylvania. Uh, but Jim is resolute that he is a Catholic and he isn't leaving. Um, he really wants to see the church reform from within. And for survivors who do not want to be antagonistic to the church to have a place and a voice within it instead. And they do want some reforms. There's this perception that Catholic survivor groups are liberal. I've actually found that many Catholics come from conservative backgrounds in terms of um, right for life, marriage, um, many social issues, basically in Catholic moral theology. But they do tend to lean liberal in terms of reforms. They are, because of their experiences, more open than most Catholics to the idea of women priests. Um, they are very much in favor of um, some of the American interpretations of Vatican II and its legacy, um, seeing the church transition to the people of God, defining church not just in terms of, of who wears the collar and the buildings they preach in, but in our everyday lives and um, in the broader faithful. And um, yes, some of them do now want legal accountability. And I would say if we've lost anything, as a country of Catholics, as a, a national community of Catholics over the last 30 years, 
it's that I think we might have lost that opportunity to work more amenably and collaboratively with survivors, at least from the standpoint of the bishops. It seems hard now to get the genie, the genie back into the bottle now that the um, history of the survivor movements and of the abuse crisis has taken such a legal, legislative, and judicial turn. So just in a few minutes, what can we kind of do? Well, one thing is we really need to retune our ears, not to ask survivors when they come forward to us, those questions about um, where were you abused? How, tell me more about how you were abused. Were there any people, you, any adults you spoke to, any classmates who might've been abused with you? Um, those details are not what survivors will remember first um, in the months and even sometimes the first few years that they come forward. That's not how um, PTSD and memory functions for a number of things. Um, but they will rather really want us to listen to what it's done to their faith, what we can do to help them move forward. They'd also like us to shift away again from that narrative of male priests and board victims, um, to not assume that the survivors in your parish or on your campus are necessarily men or that they were necessarily abused by priests. Um, a shift we all need to make is try to listen to their voices and their stories, even if um, they're not included in diocesan disclosures or they were abused by a priest who has not um, been released on a list of credibly ab ab accused uh, in that diocese or in that religious order, if it's, for example, by the Jesuits. And recognizing our own culpability, and this is kind of the last thing I'll read tonight. I can find it in my own notes. I can't. <laughs> I don't know where I was, but um, what I wanted to say there um, is really that individual Catholics and campuses and diocesan employees all participated in one way or another in the abuses and their cover up. Survivors were silenced not by, you know, I've been using the term the church, right? But that's, that's not a person, that's not an agent. Um, not some nebulous patriarchy of men in fancy hats and robes. Um, they were silenced and ignored by all of us, um, by parishioners in the pews next to them, by nuns, and as I had talked about by, for many victims, by their own family members. Um, and Catholic and non-Catholic universities tacitly supported that silencing and our deference to clerical documents and clerical knowledge. Um, and so I think to listen to survivors, to recenter them, it's time to make listening and truth our defaults when we engage with them. That's the end of my formal comments, and I'd love to have more of a conversation with you now. Brian, thanks for the informative presentation. I certainly appreciate that. So for all of the attendees, if you have a question, feel free to type it in the chat or the Q&A section, and we'll read those in the order in which we receive them. Brian, as we're waiting for the questions to start coming in, I do have a question for you. And, and so it, it seems, and, and the, the history part of your presentation was very illuminating. And it seems to me that up until, let's say, the mid 1980s to early 1990s, there was something of a cooperative relationship between the Catholic hierarchy and different groups that were representing survivors of sexual abuse, right? That seems to have dramatically changed, and it seems to me that now the dominant paradigm for dealing with the sexual abuse crisis is kind of a circling wagons paradigm, right, by the Catholic hierarchy. Um, so a couple questions. Number one, do you think that's a good strategy for the Catholic Church to pursue? And number two, have you been contacted by any Catholic dioceses um, questioning the way in which the Catholic Church is carrying out this somewhat antagonistic relationship towards survivors' networks? I've been contacted by certain bishops. I've talked to a few cardinals, and I've been working with a lot of Catholic universities, um, although not with Villanova. And um, I think there's a, a real openness and eagerness to treat survivors differently, to approach them with more respect, to make them feel heard. But the church is in a very difficult position here because that legal paradigm has been so firmly established and America more broadly is just such a litigious society right now. We love to sue one another. Um, nobody says, oh, that's okay when we're in a fender bender. 
um, we're all whipping out our insurance cards and uh, and calling people within 10 minutes. So I think there's a broader kind of cultural um, lean that, that the church has to fight there and that survivors are, are caught within as well. Um, I do think, however, there are also, you know, there's a lot of diversity within and among bishops and priests. So I've been talking about them as though they're kind of a, a monolithic entity, but I think there are, are very strong disagreements within the USCCB right now, for example, on how to treat survivors. And I've heard from people who know more about that. I see a couple of, of their names on the call um, that it's mostly a generational divide, um, but I haven't witnessed that firsthand. Thanks for that response, Brian. So we, we've got a question from Natalie. And Natalie asks, can you talk more about the scandal in Wellesley, Massachusetts? Yeah, so um, through the disclosures of the Boston Globe, um, the, the parish in Wellesley learned that one of their priests uh, had been accused. There were some of the leaders on, um, lay leaders in the parish who um, knew firsthand of a survivor, although they didn't disclose that, and they decided to hold listening sessions. Um, so there were about 10 co-founders of what quickly became known as Voice of the Faithful. Um, those listening sessions in their parish basement um, swelled. Um, they started at several hundred and grew quickly to over a thousand. Um, that summer, I don't remember the exact date, they held a convention down at the Heinz Convention Center in Boston, um, down at Copley Place, and that received national and international media attention. Um, they packed a stadium with lay Catholics from across the country and many um, smaller satellite voice of the faithful chapters were formed across the country. Um, these have kind of been um, receding and disbanding in an informal way. Voice of the Faithful is still alive and well as a national organization, but I think it's, it's much smaller and much less active locally. For example, when I moved to Chicago in 2005, there were seven Voice of the Faithful chapters in Chicago alone. And when I left in 2013, there was only one that was still around and it was meeting much less frequently with a smaller group than it used to. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that was the important of Wellesley. Good, thanks, Brian. Uh, next question comes from Sandy Hissink. Sandy is not only a member of the task force here at Villanova, she's the past president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So she asks, Brian, what kind of legacy has this left in the church's current view of children and children's rights? That's a fantastic question. And a lot of the best research on clergy abuse is coming out of clinical psychology, um, not just treatment of victims, but in Britain, um, a, a psychologist named Marie Keenan uh, has studied priests who um, have come to her after abusing or with um, desire and attraction to children written really compellingly about uh, those interactions. I think, um, I, I don't see big moves on the church's theology of children unfortunately. Um, for a long time, the church has put children in the same categories as disabled people, as um, what used to be called cripples. There was a sanctity and presumed ignorance or innocence associated with the child. Ch children were presumed to be presexual or asexual beings, maybe not um, completely cognizant or understanding of what might be done to them. Um, and I think for those reasons, they, they were more easy for some priests to victimize. One thing we see in the documents um, coming out of these legal disclosures, um, out of the grand jury reports and in individual lawsuits, is that often bishops seemed, seemed very unconcerned about individual child victims. There was this presumption, oh, they'll get over that, or you know, maybe they were coming to terms with their sexuality. There, there was just a total disregard um, for the child as an agent and for children as Catholics. I mean, some of that goes back to Catholic theology. At the same time, I do think, you know, the church is putting, trying to put forth real pragmatic solutions to prevent future abuses. I worry though that, um, you know, open doors, glass doors, more open confessionals, not being alone with the priest, that while these might kind of satisfy the criminalistic or legal profile we were talking about before, they don't get at the broader problem of why for so long, so many uh, men and women religious and their bishops didn't really view child abuse as a, a significant problem in the church. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so next question is from Julia. Uh, 
And she asks, do you think Spotlight was an accurate representation of what's going on with the current sexual abuse scandal? Yeah, so Spotlight was uh, in 2015, the film, and reflecting on events in 2002, which were themselves reflecting on events decades prior. And there are some historians, Peter Steinfels wrote a, wrote a very prominent piece in Commonweal after the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, who believe that um, the Dallas Charter in 2003, after mm -hmm. Boston, um, by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, that that solved this issue, that abuses mm -hmm. are no longer ongoing. I doubt that's the case, but we really don't have data. Survivors tend to come mm -hmm. forward 30 to 50 years after their abuse, so there's a very significant lag time. And um, we do know from the cases that have happened and been disclosed since 2002 that um, parishes, or I should say dioceses, are still um, attempting to cover up or conceal those allegations, that they're not being openly transparent, and they're not acting immediately in removing accused priests from ministry. That I shouldn't make that as a blanket statement, but more often than not, um, so that's discouraging. Um, Spotlight was a pretty accurate film in terms of what happened in Boston during that, that microcosm, and what made Boston such a compelling uh, archetype, if you will, is that this pattern of um, bishops who knew of credible allegations and shuffled priests in order to kind of ensure that the new parishes were none the wiser and, and old parishes too did not were not informed why the priests had been transferred that that pattern repeated itself not just throughout this country but throughout the world so some people have called it a playbook of sorts for the church and the canon law and the way canon law is designed to protect and adjudicate priests um, cause some of those patterns Brian, one final question is my question. So, so I, I think we're about halfway through the whole sexual abuse crisis in terms of revealing all the allegations, dealing with the legal ramifications of accountability, so on and so forth. So I still think we're, we're looking at another, you know, 30 to 50 years of a tsunami of things that are happening in the Catholic Church regarding clergy sexual abuse. If you were to give a talk to the USCCB at some point and you're to emphasize let's say three points in terms of how part two of this unfolding crisis is going to be managed, right? What would you recommend to the bishops? Well, I think transparency is really important in order to regain the trust of everyday Catholics, not just of survivors. Um, I happen to be drawn to liberation theology, which survivor movement also draws on. Um, I think there's a specific and kind of prophetic place for survivors in order to help the church identify what reforms it might make. Um, and the last is not really a piece of advice, but it's to say this is really tough. It's, it's kind of easy for us to point fingers and say, oh, if there were women priests or if we ended celibacy. But a, a tough truth is that there is no silver bullet to this crisis. Um, child abuse happens everywhere. It's never going to be completely eliminated from the Catholic Church, but learning how to deal with it in a way that is truly Catholic and truly Christian um, should be our goal. Super, Brian, we are out of time. Thanks so much for your research, for joining us here tonight, and best of luck to you in the future. And also to all the attendees who are here, many of you make an enormous difference in the lives of children. And so thanks for everything you do to make the church a safe haven for our kids. So anyway, thanks again, Brian. We appreciate this. It was good being with you tonight. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye now, everyone.